But nothing I said or did made a difference. Hey guys, thank you for clicking on this video. I really appreciate it. If you have time, please also like and subscribe as it helps me with my channel. In true crime where facts and reasoning are mandatory and necessary, YouTube is flooded with unethical clickbait videos that don't have a clue what they're talking about. I, you know, it never ceases to amaze me how low true crime Jesus and murder sheet Kevin Greenlee will go. That's who's doing this, people. It's not hard to figure out. With that being said, today's video is about the Delphi murders. In particular, Ron Logan. Ron Logan was the property owner of which Abby Williams and Libby German's bodies were discovered. Since the beginning, and even more recently, there seems to be groups of people who think that Ron Logan is in fact the killer of these two girls. Luckily, the police have asserted that Ron Logan is in fact not a suspect. He was taken into jail on a parole violation and his property was searched from head to bottom, and we can only assume that he was grilled about the murders. In my opinion, he is an innocent man whose life was ruined through social media accusations and incompetency of law enforcement. So let's take a look at another case and draw as many similarities as we can. In 2002, Brian David Mitchell abducted Elizabeth Smart in Salt Lake City because he believed he was a prophet who needed seven virgin wives to fulfill his mission. She was abducted from her family's home in Salt Lake City on June 5th. She was sexually abused for nine months by Brian and his wife, I Wanda Barzi. when you first went missing and literally hundreds of people were out looking for you. Now we know you were being held captive not very far away from your home at all. You were afraid, I assume. Yeah. Did your kidnappers tell you they would hurt you or your family if you tried to get away? I, you know, they did. And I really am here to support the bill and not to go into what, you know, what happened to me, what the whole, like, what is in my past, because I'm not here to give an interview on that. I'm here to help push this bill through. And I want you to push the bill through, and I want people to hear your voice. Frankly, it's a miracle that she was ever found. You know, a lot of people have seen shots of you wearing a burqa. How did you see out of that thing? You know, I'm really not going to talk about this at, the, at this time. I mean, that's something I just don't even look back at. And I really, I really, to be frankly honest, I really don't appreciate you bringing all this up. I'm sorry, dear. I thought that you would speak out to other victims. But you know what? I completely understand. A lot of victims don't want to talk about it and don't feel like talking about it. Let's talk about the bill. She wasn't rescued until March 2003 in Sandy, Utah. She was actually declared dead in 2002, even though her body had not been found. And how does this have anything to do with Ron Logan, you might say? Well, most of the early police investigation into Elizabeth's disappearance had focused on a suspect, Richard Ricci who also had once worked as a handyman in the smart home. Serving time in prison for parole violation during the investigation, Ricci denied having any involvement in the kidnapping. The trail grew cold after Ricci died in prison of a brain hemorrhage on August 30th. And finally, in early February, just a few months later, Mary Catherine Smart told her parents she believed that another former worker at the smart home, who called himself Emmanuel, might be Elizabeth's captor, and the smarts relayed the information to authorities. On February 3rd, believing that the police were not taking Mary Catherine's tip seriously, the smart family called their own press conference to release a sketch of Emmanuel. Several days later, a man contacted the police to inform them that Emmanuel was his disturbed stepfather, Brian David Mitchell. 
so let's talk about Richard Ricci so he had an alibi Richard Ricci the one-time handyman who police questioned in the abduction of teenager Elizabeth Smart died Friday night Ricci who's 48 underwent six hours of emergency surgery on Wednesday to correct a spontaneous brain hemorrhage. He is an individual that during our investigation, generally speaking, he never volunteered a lot of information. Ricci, who was being held at the Utah State Prison in Draper for a parole violation, told a guard that he was suffering from a headache on Tuesday evening. Deputy Director of the Utah Department of Corrections went into his cell and they found Ricci unconscious. He was taken to the prison infirmary, then airlifted to the university's hospital in Salt Lake City by helicopter. So, the abduction itself. Smart was abducted at gunpoint from the family's 6,600 square foot home in the early hours of June 5th while her parents and four brothers slept. Her younger sister, who was in the bedroom with Elizabeth, witnessed the abduction. Ricci once worked in the smart home as a handyman, but he does have a 30-year criminal record. The detectives would not characterize Ricci as a suspect, saying that there were other individuals that they were looking at that may have some kind of connection. And there also may have been some connection to Mr. Ricci. He had told us things that we don't believe are true. Documents show he provided false information that he had had a history of violence, conspired to deceive the police, and plotted an alibi for a crime that had not yet been discovered. So they found Ricci to be deceptive. Police had charged Ricci with two counts of theft and one count of burglary unrelated to Smart's abduction he had denied any involvement in the Smart case. One of the theft counts relates to an item he allegedly stole from the Smart home on about June 6, 2001, nearly one year before Elizabeth disappeared. The items taken were worth about $3,500 and included jewelry, a bottle of perfume, and a wine glass filled with seashells. Ricci also was charged with burglary and theft from another home in the same Federal Heights neighborhood. A federal grand jury last month indicted Ricci in a bank robbery that took place near Salt Lake City in November 2001, along with two other men. Ricci was charged with one count of armed bank robbery, brandishing a firearm in the commission of a violent crime, and being a felon in possession of a firearm. So it looks like he was a career criminal. Other unrelated crimes. So here's what I find a little weird. Richard Ricci's wife said Monday that he was home in bed with her the night that 14-year-old Elizabeth was abducted. 25 miles away, and she would have heard him if he had left in the middle of the night. So this is what his wife Angela said. I truly in my heart, my mind, my soul, I know that Richard did not have anything to do with this and I will stand by him. Ricci, a handyman once hired by the abducted girl's father, Ed Smart, remains the focus in the investigation in the June 5th disappearance. He was arrested for parole violation and is now being held at a state prison. The arrest was for drinking alcohol which violated a condition of his parole. So his attorney said that his client had been cooperative with authorities, undergoing 26 hours of questioning, taking a lie detector test, consenting to searches of his house and vehicles, and giving a blood sample. His attitude is that he wants to do everything he can to help, and that's what his attorney told Larry King Live. The Ricci's married on Valentine's Day this year in Nevada, and Angela Ricci says that she was aware of her husband's extensive criminal record, which includes the attempted murder of a police officer. While she has pain medication for her injuries from a vehicle accident, she said that contrary to news reports, she had taken no medication the night of Smart's disappearance, which could have prevented her from hearing her husband leave the house. 
She also said that he acted normally the next morning when the couple learned of the girl's abduction on television. He said, I wonder if that's Ed's daughter. She said, Then when he saw Mr. Smart on the TV, he was very heartbroken. He really liked the Smarts, especially Ed. He had a lot of respect for him. Angela Ricci said that she went to bed that night about 1.30 in the morning, which is about three hours after her husband, and that they woke up at 6 in the morning. Police have indicated that the abduction happened between 1 and 2 in the morning. Smith said that the timeline argues against Ricci as the perpetrator because it's half an hour drive each way from his home in Kearns, a suburb of Salt Lake City, to the Smart Home, which is in the Federal Heights neighborhood on the city's northeast side. If Ricci had waited for his wife to fall asleep, he would have been hard-pressed to drive to Salt Lake City, break into the home, take the girl, dispose of her and any evidence, and then drive back to Kearns before his wife woke up. She also said that her husband does not have dark hair on the back of his hands, and that was a part of the description of the suspect provided by Elizabeth's sister. So as you can see, Ricci and Logan have quite a bit in common. Now I know you guys can obviously cherry pick and you can go through a lot of stuff that they do not have in common, but I think we can agree that they both have parole violations for drinking. They were both reported as being deceptive to law enforcement. They both died before their crime they were accused of was solved. They both have alleged violent pasts. They have not publicly been named as a suspect, but they've been prosecuted by the court of public opinion. So, I want to talk about the sketches. So as you can see, there was a sketch in the Elizabeth Smart case that was done by Elizabeth's sister who saw the abduction take place. And obviously, Ricci didn't fit some of the qualifications for that description. So if we go to the Delphi case, and we look at the two sketches given to us, obviously we can see that, you know, the first sketch that was released, it kind of looks like Ron Logan. But when they released the second sketch of the younger male, you gotta wonder, how the hell does Ron Logan fit into that young bridge guy sketch? You really have to do mental gymnastics. And for everybody out there blaming Ron Logan of murder, please try to explain the second sketch to us. Because so far, all you guys are doing is, you know, blaming what could be an innocent man of murder. Really no justifications or excuses for that because there's no evidence here. But alright guys, I'm going to get out of here. If you have any questions, comments, rebuttals, please put them in the comment section. And I'm going to leave you guys with some news clips that might open your mind and think about things in a different way if you are into this whole Ron Logan thing. What is a realistic timeline? Then? I don't you say, know. You say tonight, tomorrow, next week, truly, like within six months, a year? What are we looking at? I don't at? know. I, I mean, if I would have predicted it early on, I wouldn't have predicted we'd be at five years. So, you know, putting a timeline on it is probably not the appropriate thing to do. I do believe that that I'll see it. I, I believe that I'll, I'll, I'll see it. Uh, it's just constantly evolving. Anthony Schoss. Kegan Klein. Kegan Klein. A judge already agreed once to push that trial to May. The killer has never been caught. We sat down with Superintendent Carter to ask him if that day would ever come. To the killer, who may be in this room. We believe you are hiding in plain sight. It's been nearly three years since Indiana State Police Superintendent Doug Carter looked into television cameras and said those chilling words to the person who killed Abby Williams and Libby German. Did you think the person was there that day? I thought there was a chance that that, that he was, or in the air, or, or somewhere close by. And then these words from Carter, just days before the five-year anniversary of the girls' murders. He'll be watching this. He'll be watching this. He'll be watching this. 
What Carter couldn't say is who he is. Do you know the suspect? I, I wouldn't go that far. Or a definitive timeline for his arrest. What is a realistic timeline? I don't know. Only that investigators are working on it every single day, and Carter holds himself accountable for a conclusion being reached. It's certainly my, my intention that this case comes to some level of conclusion by the time um, Governor Holcomb's time's up. And that's very personal to me. But I also think it could be sooner than that. And I also spoke in an exclusive jailhouse interview with the man behind that fake profile. He admits he created it. His name is Kegan Klein. He's in jail on unrelated charges. But he says that investigators have told him that he was the last person to communicate with Libby before her murder. And you'll hear from him later in the show. Robin? Okay, any, any reaction? about possible developments from family members are not just yet until they're revealed. They are cautiously optimistic. They don't want to get their hopes up that something is going to lead to an arrest or a conclusion in the case until they're told that that is exactly what is happening. But um, this is a very difficult week for them and they are asking for anybody who wants to honor the girls to uh, perhaps donate to a local shelter for people or pets in your area, perform a random act of kindness, or even learn the details of this case and share it on your social media platform so that you can spread the word that this is an unsolved case. I mean, um, like I've said this theory before, let's say um, they have touch DNA, okay? And um, hey, Dragon Thunder, uh, say they have touch DNA, or as I would suspect, if they're gonna have any kind of DNA, I would think it'd have been under Libby's fingernails because Libby fought. And uh, I would think it would have to be underneath Libby's fingernails. So I think any, and, and law enforcement knows this, any good defense attorney could simply say, hey, my client had, has already told you he was at the trails that day. You know, he was passing the girls and he tripped over a branch and, uh, he almost fell and Libby went to grab him and she accidentally scratched him. What can I say? You know, can't prove it's not true. And you only get one chance to go at it. If he beats it the first time, that's it.